Hello YouTube and welcome back to Be A Loser. In the not too distant past, we all knew that snacking was generally a bad idea. I'm sure at some point your mother or grandmother told you not to have a snack because it would ruin your appetite or didn't make you fat. It was also at this same time that obesity wasn't really an issue either. But when we changed how we viewed food to our more modern methods of calorie counting and low fat diets, we decided that snacking was now actually good for us. Perhaps you've also heard the advice that eating more throughout the day is better for losing weight. More frequent, smaller meals, aka snacks, are what's recommended by many as a good weight loss strategy. In fact, there are many books and articles written by dietitians that snacking is actually really good for us. So once again, we've made a complete turnaround from how we ate 50 years ago to today. And in the meantime, most of us have become overweight or obese. So. Is snacking actually good for us? The answer to why we began believing that snacking was good for us is actually explored in a BBC series by Jacques Peretti titled The Men Who Made Us Fat. And apologies for the spoiler, but the answer is that it was the food industry known as Big Food who convinced us. At some point in the 1950s, food companies had an issue to deal with. There was more food supply than there was demand. As we've explored before, the standard meal schedule at that time was to only eat two or three meals per day. But the downside for big food was that with that schedule, food sales had a limit. So someone in the marketing department had the brilliant idea to introduce new eating opportunities. If we're now eating a small meal between breakfast and lunch, between lunch and dinner, and before bed, well, then the food companies can sell much more food. And in order to make the food we would eat at these times easy to eat, as well as inexpensive, the food companies turn to the readily available refined carbohydrate. Foods made of mostly sugar and flour don't easily spoil. Go ahead and check your pantry for a box of crackers and see if you can remember when you bought it. How about a box of cookies? What's the expiration date on that? And we all know that Twinkies last forever. So Big Food not only convinced us that snacking was okay, but indeed that it was healthy. The problem with snacking is that it increases the risk of becoming insulin resistant. We'll explore insulin resistance in depth in a future video, but what's important is that two things are required to become insulin resistant. High levels of insulin and persistent levels of insulin. We already know that refined carbs create high levels of insulin production, and with increased eating opportunities, we have persistent levels of insulin production. So the ultimate outcome of these two situations, created by snacking, is of course insulin resistance. This IR then leads to higher levels of insulin, which leads to weight gain, obesity, and diabetes. What we need is a balance between the two phases of insulin, the fed state, when insulin is dominant, and the fasting state, when insulin is deficient. Since we started snacking as a society, we're spending the majority of our time in the fed state. Now some people might say that we're overstating things here a bit, that we really don't snack that much as a society. And perhaps some individuals don't. But a study in 2010 published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition took a look at the US from 1977 to 2006. And the sample size was pretty convincing, 28,404 children and 36,846 adults. They tabulated the number of eating opportunities over the time frame. Both the children and adults demonstrated the same pattern over time. In 1977, most of them ate three times per day. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, no snacks. At this time, as we've seen, obesity wasn't much of an issue. But by 2003, the eating pattern was eating five times per day, three meals and two snacks. Looking at the average of the subjects, they went from eating three and a half times per day to five times per day. The average time between meals went from 271 minutes in 1977 to 208 minutes. That's a nearly 30% decrease in time between eating. Somewhere along the line, we were convinced that this was healthy for us. Doctors and dietitians were telling us to snack. Vending machines were added to schools and then stocked with healthy snacks so our kids could eat constantly as well. All the while being told that it's not just acceptable, but healthy. Our eating schedule and that of our kids is breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner. And for kids, there are snacks during soccer practice too, 
We eat everywhere all the time. Burgers in the car, popcorn at the movie, hot pocket in front of the computer, oranges during halftime with the game. I see coworkers constantly eating power bars and bananas during breaks at work. Think about it, we spend millions of dollars to be sure our kids get their snacks. Then we spend millions more to try and fight childhood obesity. And all the while, someone, somewhere, is getting rich. We feed these poor kids all day long and then tell them to get off their butts and lose some weight. And naturally, we all think we know exactly how to do that. We focus so closely on what should we eat, processed or unprocessed food, low fat or low carb, Organic or not organic? GMO or non-GMO? Meat or no meat? What we never ask is when should we eat? And that of course comes back to our flawed view of counting calories. All that matters under that suggested method of weight loss is the total calories eaten in a day. Meal timing doesn't matter at all, but clearly it does matter. Constant eating leads to persistent levels of insulin, and we know that that is a main key to becoming insulin resistant. So focusing on the first part of the equation is fine, what to eat. But if we eat what's recommended, low fat, high carbohydrate, then we generate high levels of insulin and coupling that with snacking, eating all the time, we get both parts of the IR equation. The devious part of all of this is that it takes a long time to become overweight. Most people generally start out thin as teenagers and only gain a pound or two per year. But after 40 years, when you're in your 60s, you could be 80 pounds overweight. Additionally, how long you've been struggling with weight gain determines how difficult it is for you to lose weight. Individuals who have recent weight gain haven't had time to become severely insulin resistant, and thus a simple dietary intervention, changing what you eat, is enough to lose the weight. But individuals who've struggled to lose weight for years have developed severe IR and thus have a harder time losing weight. Because of this, the elevated insulin levels may not be affected by simple dietary changes. As we stated before, in the 70s, people generally ate breakfast at 7 a.m. and dinner at 7 p.m. This gave them 12 hours in the fed state where insulin is dominant and 12 hours in the fasted state when insulin is deficient. But fast forward to the late 90s and early 2000s and we're snacking all through the day. We're spending the majority of our time in the insulin dominant state. And this in turn has led to the obesity and diabetes epidemic in which we find ourselves now. And the frustrating part of this, it's our current medical and nutritional advice that perpetuates all of this. In order to lose weight, we need to reduce the persistent levels of high insulin. We achieve this by either eating fewer refined carbs and sugars, the what to eat question, or by eating fewer meals, the when to eat question, or of course both. But when we speak with our nutritional experts, the advice is typically the opposite. Eat less fat and more whole grains. This leads to high insulin levels. Eat more small meals throughout the day. This leads to persistent levels of insulin. Now we've met the two requirements for insulin resistance. How can anyone believe that eating more will cause you to lose weight? Why would we be given this advice? Once again, it comes back to money. No one makes money if you don't eat. If you drink more milk or eat more yogurt, then dairy farmers make more money. If you eat more cereal, then cereal companies make more money. More cookies and crackers, more potato chips, more pretzels, more donuts. The list is truly infinite. And the money train continues beyond big food as well. Food and drug companies provide grant money to doctors and dietitians. This money is not trivial, and thus, there's no one in the medical or dietary industry that's motivated to instruct you to eat less. But thankfully for us, studies have shown the truth. A study published in the British Journal of Nutrition in 2010 showed that increasing meal frequency makes no significant difference in weight loss or gain. And a study published in the Journal of Nutrition in 2001 showed the perils of snacking. In this study, the subjects were given mandatory snacks. It's clear that eating snacks decreases the calories eaten at mealtimes. However, that reduction at mealtimes does not compensate for the calories eaten when snacking. Simply put, snacking does not decrease total food intake. It increases it. We don't need Sherlock Holmes to figure that one out. 
Now, most snack food is made from highly processed food, which is far cheaper to make than whole food. We know that these types of foods stimulate insulin greatly, and now we know that they stimulate money to big food and big pharma as well. Now, I know this video is about snacking, but let's wrap up by talking about breakfast. I'm sure you know that food companies constantly bombard you with the slogan, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. They'll tell you that if you skip breakfast, you'll be hungry and irritable all day, and this will lead to overeating. In fact, I'm sure there are many people who live in fear of missing breakfast. But let's all take a deep breath and remember the origin of the word breakfast. It literally means the meal that breaks your fast. So if you eat your first meal of the day at 1 p.m., this is your breakfast. Is there really a problem with that? Turns out that there's actually a problem with eating in the morning. A study published in the Nutrition Journal in 2011 divided subjects into groups based on the calories they ate at breakfast. As it turns out, increasing food intake at breakfast does not result in decreased food intake for lunch and dinner. Simply put, the more you eat at breakfast, the more you eat for the entire day. Additionally, eating breakfast increases the number of eating opportunities in the day. This obviously makes breakfast in the morning a double whammy for the day and devastating for persistent insulin levels. And in reality, for most people, breakfast is actually a triple threat. As we've discussed, we tend to be in a rush in the morning. So most breakfast foods intentionally are made from highly refined carbohydrates, right? Donuts, bagels, cereals, pastries, muffins, oatmeal, orange juice. This, of course, gives a very high level of insulin secretion. So breakfast in the morning, at its worst, helps fulfill both of our requirements for IR, high insulin levels and persistent insulin levels. But of course, the food company saw a huge opportunity to make money. Eat breakfast. It's the most important meal of the day. You'll be hungry all day if you don't. I may have heard a commercial like that before. So the mantra of food companies, doctors and dietitians, then becomes, you can lose weight by eating breakfast and you can lose weight by eating snacks. Translation, eat more and lose weight? No, I don't think so. That's not going to happen. So adding what we learned from the circadian rhythms video, our best strategy for losing weight is to eat one, two, or three meals per day. Space these meals out by at least four to six hours. Do not snack between the meals. And if you eat fewer than three meals, then ideally break your fast at lunch. Oh, and remember to avoid processed foods, especially refined carbs. And that's it. Eat less often, eat better food, lose weight. Can I get a duh? And we'll wrap up there. We have many more videos to come in this series, as well as all of our series. And yes, more cooking. So if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get those. And remember to enable alerts by clicking the bell so that you receive alerts when those videos post. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Be A Loser Today and on our website, BeALoser.Today. If you like this video or any of our videos, please remember to click the like button and please share your favorite videos with friends and family, as well as leaving comments and questions. You can click the video thumbnails at the end of this video to see the circadian rhythm video, as well as the history of the American diet video. And those do work on your mobile device. As always, thanks so much for watching, and until next time, keep being a loser.